The, re the reason I prefer to be called Bill is that when I was young, I heard somebody call, saying, shall we pay the bill? And, uh, and, and, and I heard somebody else say, yes, pay, pay, pay the bill now. And ever since then, I've been, wa I've been waiting for somebody to pay the bill, but it doesn't come now. <laughs> Well, I guess in a way it used to come, but it doesn't come so much now because I'm officially retired and so there's no institution that con continuously pays my bill. <laughs> anyway, to, you know, enough, enough waffle. They say that Westerners can't stop talking and I must go against that. I must not do that. All right, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm developing principles for communication-oriented language teaching. Now, personally, I, I, I use that term more often now, communication-oriented language teaching or cult better than CLT, because CLT comes with so much baggage, you know, that people sort of feel guilty if they're not doing it, and they wonder what it is, and, and things like that. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll come to that a bit later. Because, uh, as I say in the, in the, in the first slide... Sl oh, yeah. yeah. One, of the, one, one, one of the issues with communicative language teaching, which has been around now for about 40 years now, a long, a long, long time, um, is, is that nobody has ever really decided what, what it means. Uh, and, you know, you get, that, you get that in certain quotations like Nina Spada in, in one of her encyclopedia articles. She, she begins by saying, the answer, what does communicative language teaching mean? The answer to this question seems to depend on whom you ask. And Harmer in, in an article in 2003, says more or less the same. The problem with CLT is that the term has always meant a multitude of different things to different people. And Hall, in, in Graham Hall, in his Exploring English Language Teaching, quite recent, says more or less the same. Everyday classroom practices can appear to be quite different when CLT principles are applied in different social and educational contexts. So it changes a lot with different contexts. Well, in a way, that's quite normal. That's been the, that's been the, the same with every approach, really, that, that, that they, 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 nobody could really pin them down to what, 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 what they really mean, and they've meant different things to different people. And actually, there's nothing wrong with that, because as Dick Allwright was saying, really, sort of the practice of language teaching comes from the context and from, and from that. But with, with, with CLT, people have tended to think that there is one definitive version and, uh, and that's the version that we, we should all be practicing and, and, and uh, not really like that. If, you're, if, we, if we say, but with the communicative language teaching, it's maybe been a little bit more com complicated because right from the start, it sort of had two branches to it. Um, and you, you can think of the branches if you look at this sort of diagram of the two dimensions of learning, the analytic dimension and the experiential dimension, both of them leading, which could lead to communicative competence, but just which ones are the most effective is, is one of the eternal debates, really. The analytical dimension, where you separate out forms and you focus on the forms and give instruction, you, you apply a lot of conscious learning, then you become increasingly automatic with the correct language that some teacher has taught you, becomes more and more automatic, and gradually you can use it more for communicative competence to communicate with it. On the one side, that, that set of learning pr pr um, um, processes. But then on the other side, the experiential dimension, uh, the, uh, that we have communication where the main focus is on meaning, meaning and there's a lot of subconscious learning and integration of learning going on, the kind of learning that goes on in the natural environment or so-called acquisition of ch that children carry out, where the whole system becomes increasingly correct, and that also leading to communicative competence. And so those two s processes of learning going on, and communicative language teaching has, has differed in the focus that it puts on these two. We've had a so-called weak version of communicative language teaching, which says that we can still use this analytic dimension. We can still separate out forms and teach them, and so that teachers can still use the, all the techniques like drills, explanations, pattern practice, exercises on the analytic dimension as leading to communicative competence. But also, the, we have the strong version of communicative language teaching, which many people have advocated. Um, Dick Allwright has been one, not in, not in today's paper, but in many of the things that he has written, 
uh, advocating this strong version of communicative language teaching where learning goes on through experiential experiencing language through communication right from the start and that's the main focus and we've often been rather vague when we talk about communicative language teaching which of these versions are we talking about are we talking about the the one the, the weak version which is uh, gives the much more familiar framework for teaching really in fact Thornbury in one of his recent articles calls it the old PPP model under a different name you present you practice and you perform so that you, you because you can still use all the analytic te techniques or are we, are we talking about the, the strong version where we want people to be using language for communication nearly all the time? But anyway, both of these versions, they differ in, they differ in, the, in the sense of whether they allow a lot of room or a lot of value for controlled teaching, but they agree in that both of them give an important role to the teacher in organising communicative activities in the classroom and getting the students to use the language in the classroom, and that's been one of the um, key features of it in, in every country and also within Asia it's been one of the ones which where, where many teachers have found it a, a sort of new um, type of teaching to get used to um, not only in a Asia but in other countries in other parts as well and there's uh, exactly what so exactly what CLT means then has been not always been agreed on and, and sometimes Thompson way back in 1996 um, he, from his, his different workshops, he gathered some of the various interpretations or we could say misinterpretations, but that always seems to carry, carry the implication that there's some correct interpretation that everybody's got, which is not true. But, but well, every, every interpretation where people say that is what it is, is a misinterpretation in, in, in my perceptions because we don't, we, there's so many different ways of looking at everything. But any, anyway, the sorts of interpretations that C CLT means always using pair work and group work, means teaching only speaking, means not teaching grammar, means a lot of hard work for the teacher, creating new types of activities. That's th those are common perceptions of CLT that, that, that have grown up. And in East Asia, in the survey of Ho, Ho, and, Wong, Ho and Wong, again, it, it, one, of, one of the key factors is it, it means giving students a lot of opportunities to use the language in class and providing the teachers with communicative activities in their repertoire of language skills. And it's that area of, of introducing communicative activities in the classroom that is, has been one of the ones where um, different people have had different reactions to it, not, not always favourable and not, not, not always e easy. And it's created some, in, in many countries, it's created some practical challenges for people who have become accustomed to using um, more sort of structure oriented or controlled approach when they come to being asked to do different things and the sorts of challenges that people face um, this list I've, I've made up mainly from those the, those at the bottom uh, from Yuko Butler who looked at several countries from um, Ji, Ji Hyun John who is here, here in front here with us who, who's uh, look, looked, at, looked at Korea and, and um, myself, I, I did a survey of different countries in Asia and Wang in, in, in China. They've done sort of um, the, the kinds of challenges that teachers have found with it, that they need new organizational skills for group activities, unfamiliar roles in the classroom, classroom management may be a problem, and students resorting to the mother tongue in, in, in tasks, students performing tasks with the minimal use of language, just gestures sometimes, just sort of or single words, excessive demands on the language competence, sometimes of the teacher as well, a conflict with the educational traditions and conceptions of learning, which sees learning as more as something which is controlled and where the teacher controls it, and mainly, probably the main one, the incompatibility with some public examinations, which are, which are often very form-focused and, and um, don't really allow, give, give, give enough um, reward for being able to use the language in creative kinds of ways, which lies at the heart of um, the, the, the spirit of communicative language teaching, if you like. So that various challenges have come up there. Uh, I, I don't mean that in a negative way. They are just the ways that things think cha that, that when, when changes come along, um, 
then there are always various challenges, and challenges can be very fruitful and very, very, very positive. But uh, um, there. So the result is, is, is uh, one of the backgrounds to it is, is uh, many people say is that communicative language teaching was first conceived in, in what Adrian Holiday calls them BANA, B-A-N-A -A context, British and American and New Zealand small public, small language school context where people had small groups living in the country and everybody was well motivated and so the, they, you could do a lot of things like with, 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 the, with the language which then become more problematic or more challenging when you want to do them in the large classes and, 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 uh, and examination oriented contexts where people also have um, exported communicative language teaching to it. So that, in the words of um, Heap, a, 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 a gentleman in, in Vietnam, who wrote, uh, in, in, one, in an article, many teachers now, they, if you look at CL community of language teaching like as a package of ideas and techniques, there are now many people, many teachers within Asia would re reject it as a package of techniques, but that does not mean that they reject the spirit of CLT, and it's so, so that it might be a, a case of where we need to go back to the spirit of CLT and then try to derive from it what, what, uh, what can be done in specific contexts. And as he, as he describes it, the spirit of CLT is, is that we need to focus on learners and learning, that we need to help learners to use the language effectively for their own communicative needs, and that it's most likely to happen when classroom activities are real and meaningful to learners. Now, th those might, might seem sort of obvious, really, but there are many, many contexts where those things do not take place. And one of the uh, benefits of CLT, or one of the um, contributions of CLT, can, can be to actually focus attention on these basic, basic requirements that are needed uh, and w to derive a, 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 an approach an approach which can be implemented then in specific contexts. But it, the, it's the, in the specific context then that on these very broad, very basic principles then, rather than importing an approach from somewhere else, every context can derive its own um, approach, drawing on its own traditions, its own teachers' skills, its, uh, its own learners' needs, what they need, etc., uh, in order to uh, do it, so what? So the um, some of the ways towards approaching it may be to first to integrate CLT with traditional approach, to integrate the new ideas into a traditional approach which is already going on in the country, or to develop a new framework of principles for developing a context-sensitive approach. So working towards more general principles, which are not constraining, but are, but are sufficiently well-grounded that we can say, that is, th those are principles that we can all accept, maybe the, these basic principles of, of Heap, the Vietnamese gentleman. It would be hard to argue against the, the need to make learning meaningful and to going towards communication. And then teachers and researchers together can explore key specific issues within different contexts for communication-oriented language teaching suited to any particular context. So let's just, let's just look, at, look at one or two of these approaches the, the way they have been. First, the, the integrating CLT ideas and techniques into a traditional approach. I'll, in a moment, I'll question this dichotomy traditional and CLT, which might, might not be a, appropriate really now, now. But for the moment, um, m many people have used that sort of dichotomy, traditional approach, CLT approach. Um, but it might be better to get away from it. <laughs> uh, but we'll come to that in a moment. But so uh, d uh, a study by Zheng and Adamson in, in Beijing, they, they looked at how a teacher set about doing this sort of integration. And they give an, in, an interesting account. It's, it's actually it's based on the, um, on the PhD work by, by, by Zheng, um, that the teacher stays with his own traditional ways of doing things in the sense of uh, being a knowledge transmitter, 
giving dramatical explanations, using pattern drills and using memorization techniques. So all of these things that are well established within the Chinese tradition. But he then integrates new ideas into that, for example, by organizing more interaction in his classes, eliciting more creative responses from the students, and relating the language not only to context provided by the textbook, but also to students' own personal experience. So that integrating the be what he sees as the best from both sides, he creates his own approach towards motivating and bringing the students towards that. And uh, uh, other, an an another example in Hong Kong, uh, Carlos has observed that many teachers, they, they find it difficult to do a lot of the communication activities, the sort of pair work where, where people negotiate meaning. I mean, you know, negotiate meaning is a sort of common fra phrase we, we, we read about. But it, 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 it's, it's difficult quite often for teachers in Hong Kong to set up pair work and group work where there's this, really this negotiation of meaning going on for, for, for various re reasons. So what a lot of them do is rather than communicative activities, they develop more co contextualized practice, practice of language which is, which is within a particular context. And so they, they don't go into the negotiation of meaning area so much. And he argues that Hong Kong needs a, a situated approach. A situa for him, a task-based approach, because he's talking about task-based learning. A situated, a situated task-based approach, which may build on the principles of task-based learning, but needs to be adapted in the sense that the role of grammar instruction is better, is better clarified. There are clearer links with the examination requirements. One of the, one of the main things that teachers um, are worried about, whether it corresponds to examination requirements and also there's a balance between oral tasks and other types of tasks because the the official versions of CLT tend to give a lot of emphasis to oral tasks but not quite so much to other kinds of tasks so if we now turn also to Korea we have similar I I ideas a study by Mitchell and Lee say show how a Korean teacher and also an English teacher of French they're, they're similar in that it, they, they focus on teacher-led interaction of, correct f of mastery of correct language models rather than the sort of communicative negotiation of meaning, the communication, the, 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 the fluent language use that we usually associate with C CLT. And again, Ji Hyun, John <laughs> and, 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 and her colleague, they have come to a similar kind of conclusion with, with regard to the Korean context and the way they put it, it is time to seek a Korean way to develop communicative competence in English. So one which will uh, draw things together but be rooted within the Korean context, uh, making, drawing ideas from every direction. So all of these things sort of raise the question, they raise a question which, which is formulated in an article by Beaumont and Chang. Chang was... Uh, would be here except that she's having some kind of examination meeting or something. She works in Seoul in, in, the, in, in, the, some, in, 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 in the research, in, in a research institute in Seoul. And, and she and, and, and Beaumont together, they, they, they've written an interesting article where they, they, they basing on this, this sort of thing, they raise the question of whether it really makes sense nowadays to draw a distinction between CLT and traditional, which seems to suggest that there are two different currents, you know, and, and, and suggested it might actually inhibit methodological, uh, um, methodological innovation if we always feel that we have to label something as either CLT or traditional and then sort of say we are mixing them or, or we, we are choosing one rather than the other. And um, so why, uh, oh sorry, so if, if we step aside from that distinction which, which is really a historical distinction, really. Um, why not view all, all ideas and techniques from all sorts of sources, whether they be traditional, CLT or others, just as one common repertoire of techniques? Not traditional, not CLT, not bound to any particular um, place or, 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 or anything like that, but just as a common repertoire of techniques that have grown up over the ages, and all these different accounts of method methodology, they show what an infinite number of techniques and ideas we, we, we've developed in, in, 
now in order to um, develop a, a principle basis for integrating the new ideas with the familiar ideas within one framework. So what we need is a broader non-prescriptive framework which will orient us towards these two principles which um, heap the Vietnamese gentleman which, which he uh, mentioned towards making uh, uh, creating experiences which are real and meaningful to the learners and also which help them to fulfill their communicative needs within particular contexts and this broader approach I'm suggesting here now that we might not call it CLT but we might call it so COLT cult communication oriented language teaching um, some people who have been in the job <laughs> as long as I have, they associated the word cult with, a, with an observation scheme for language teaching, which was developed in Canada. But uh, that's, just that's, that's just sad. Cult can also mean other things. But anyway, what, what, what you call it is neither here nor there, in a way. In, in fact, it's a, rather, it's a little bit unfortunate that in, in language teaching we feel obliged to call something something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> really... Really, we, we just like, 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 like some of the best books, like the ones by Don Byrne, uh, where they have all kinds of communicative techniques, but they don't talk about communicative language teaching at all. They just talk about successful language teaching. So, but, we, but somehow we seem to be bound up with, with wanting to have a, a label. So maybe CLT is not such a good label anymore because it, 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 it has all these other connotations. And maybe we should uh, call it something else. Anyway, well, what are the, the sort of, so we've got to try to find, find some kind of approach to, to developing a framework for this communication, communication oriented language teaching, which will fit different contexts, be based on sound principles, but not tie people to one particular approach or a different context. And I'll just out outline briefly three, of, three approaches. One of them is, is, is the one taken by Rod Ellis where you start from second language acquisition and you look at what are the things we know about second language acquisition and can we from that derive some principles which we say language teaching must fulfill. And, and, and the, these, are the, these are the kinds of things that he suggests. Providing extensive L2 input, opportunities for output, focus on meaning but also focus on form, opportunities to interact, Respecting natural sequences, focusing on subconscious as well as conscious knowledge, taking account of individual differences, getting them to use fixed or formulaic expressions, and also examining freak production as well as controlled production. Okay, so he's derived those from second language acquisition. So you could say that that is actually a theory to practice approach, as, as Dick Allwright was, 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 was outlining this morning, where he's taken the second language acquisition th theory as being the theory and is deriving from that what would be the principles and of course somewhere within it there would need to be some kind of mechanism for testing out whether these principles are valid or whether better ones might be one of the things that strikes me in these various approaches in fact is that hardly any of them emphasize motivation which as teachers I think I think I think most of us would recognize that motivation is certainly not the the, the you know, certainly a, a very important f factor. So, um, the uh, another a, a, se a second approach, the one by the one by Kumar Ravadi Valu, is to is to is to, is, is to um, base it on teachers' experience and sense of plausibility is the word he uses, uh, in order to look at what are the things that seem to be strategies general strategies for language teaching which teachers can then apply in their different in their different ways and these are his 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 10 everybody works with 10 10 of everything so so the 10 macro strategies of maximizing learning opportunity i won't describe them in detail you can look it up uh, if, if, if you want if anybody wants this, this um, there's a version of this on the website, I think, of, the, of, the, of, an, of an article which gives these references, or you can write to me if you want to for the, 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 webs, the, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint. The, I'll just mention them briefly. Maximize learning opportunities, minimize perceptual mismatches, etc. There's no need to go through them in detail, except that to mention that that's, this is an alternative approach to it. Rather than what are the principles of, of language acquisition, what are the things we know about language teaching so that we can derive strategies which general strategies 
which teachers can then implement in whatever ways they think are best suited to the specific learns that they have in front of them. So something like maximising input is a general strategy which could be um, implemented in sort of a whole host of different ways according to the context, what kind of input, etc., and, and what things are available, etc. So that's a, a second way. And then a third way, which is the one I, 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 take, I take myself mainly. I, I, they're, they're not, they're, they're not uh, I mean, you can, take, you can, look, you can use all, all, all of them simultaneously, really, is, is to work on, try to work on what the, the, the professional history, if you like, of language teaching, what people know about the kinds of things that make language teaching work, and build a, build a kind of framework for a methodology which, which builds on what we know about how languages are learnt in the classroom and tries to systematise it in order to make things, to derive activities, which these two things, again, I'll come back to from, from Heap, which lead towards communicative competence and which are meaningful and motivating to the learners. And th this, this, is, this is the framework which, 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 which I use myself of, of a, a, a sort of continuum from non-communicative learning. These are continuum of activities. It doesn't mean it's a sequence at all, but it's a, it's a, a, a continuum of act activity types on which teachers can draw for their, for, for their var various different purposes. So we have non-communicative learning. I'll give you an example. Just something simply where people are just focusing on the language. So here, the placement of, ad of adverbs. This is an activity taken out of one of the uh, books by, um, I don't know, one, one of the textbooks, but there's, there's hundreds of them around. It simply focuses on the, places, the placement of adverbs, and it doesn't look at meaning at all. It's simply a structure-oriented and non-communicative learning. But if we go a stage further, and we try to link the language that they're learning with meanings, not necessarily now expressing, not necessarily now sending messages, communicating with each other, but making a link with meaning at the conceptual level. Then we get a whole lot of things which I call pre-communicative language practice, which could be things like the question and answer practice. You know, how many doors are there in this room? How many men are there here? How many ladies are here? How many ladies are wearing a, a black dress? You know, are all the old common sort of things that we talk about, you know? Um, and uh, or, or uh, I've given an example there. I've given an example here out of a textbook where there's a, a, where there's, there's a, a little table with all the things that John has to do, but all the things that he would like to do. And likewise for Rachel. And then the, the students just have to talk about it. John uh, John has to clean the floors, but he would like to go to evening school or, th or things like that. So they're not communicating meanings, but they're just using it to re connect it with the concepts that are there. So I, I call it pre-communicative in the sense that it's not yet communicating, but it's still c connecting with, with the concepts. And, and then a stage further, communicative language practice, doing the same sort of thing, but now actually communicating meanings to each other. So the same sort of activity could be done, but they're now doing information exchange, but it's still language which the teacher has just taught. Uh, but they're having to do it in order to communicate meanings with, with, with each other. And then one stage further, I call structured communication, where the, 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 the teacher has structured the situation in such a way that he or she knows the students can cope with it, with the language they have. So he, might, he or she might have also taught the specific language for it, but in principle the students could use any language that happens to come up into their mind in order to express their meanings. But it's kind of sheltered, a bit like sheltered communication, if you like. The teacher has, has created a context where he or she knows what it can be. So this one is taken out of Penny Err's book, talking about a better tomorrow, using the future tense. So the, t the, the teacher knows that the students will need to use the, the future tense, knows that the students have just been practicing it, so they knows that they can do it, in that sense, but they can say a lot of other things if, it, if they want to. And then, further along, authentic communication, when you can't really predict what people will want to say, they might need to, learn, to draw on any language that, that, that they have, and, and, so, and, and they themselves can, can range from small tasks like this, discuss music, to 
much larger tasks where the students are having to design a world for a better tomorrow and go off and do research and things like that and work out what, what they're doing. And, 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 and as it gets further and further in the direction of that, so it makes more demands on their conceptual development and also on their interpersonal development. So that the language learning now goes beyond communicative development and goes into interpersonal development and um, cognitive development much more. So there, there, there's that kind of continuum that one can use. So that is the, like the continuum going from leading in the direction of commun being able to, c to communicate. But, and and uh, actually this, this framework was used to was, was used to analyse the lessons of some teachers in, 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 in mainland China, in, in, uh, in, in Guangzhou, uh, to analyse the communicativeness of their activities. And what, what, they, what they found was up there that for those who, through t teachers, they mostly, on average, used non-communicative learning, if you analyse activities in that sense. You can't put every activity easily into a box, you know, you have to interpret and, and, and it has its weaknesses and everything. It's just like a, a sort of work guide, you know. Um, so, so if you take Betty, for example, nearly all her activities were pre-communicative, they were non-communicative, and, and uh, some pre-communicative and not many communicative language practice activities, and nothing at all in the structured communication or authentic communication. This was, a, was, was in a context where the official policy was that teachers would be doing task-based learning, but, in the, it, but the, the teachers, that's how far the teachers went in their own practice, if you apply that framework to it. So the framework could be used as a kind of way, if they wanted to, for teachers to develop that in, in the direction of the authentic communication which at some point they're going to be wanting to use when they go out into the real life for, for it. And if you look at, um, if, if, if you look at one, th th there's, there's the analysis of one teacher's activities. I don't know why the, the, the percentages are slightly different, but it doesn't matter. Um, I have to look at the article again. So 62.8 of the activities were non-communicative. 32.1 were pre-communicative and 5.1 were communicative language practice. There were none which would come into the box of structured communication and none which would come into the authentic communication. But one of the interesting things was, I find it very interesting, is that if you ask the teachers and the students, she asked the teachers and the students, well, which do you think were the most interesting and exciting activities then? The ones they chose were actually activities that came into the non-communicative learning one. This one called the bomb game, for example. These were primary school kids where, um, I can't, oh, I've forgotten exactly how it works, but somehow w when certain things happen, they have to go under the, under the table, <laughs> imagining that there's a bomb coming, something, something like that, you know? And, 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 the ki and the kids loved that, and the teachers thought it was wonderful, and they were learning ever such a lot. And that, and that illustrates a point, I think, that in fact, if we're going to have some kind of framework. Now, that, 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 this framework here might, this, this, fra this framework here might talk about the, the, the direction going towards communication, but then, of course, there's this very important motivation axis of involvement, making the activities meaningful, because you can have an activity which really is ever so communicative, wonderfully communicative, but it can be totally meaningless to the kids, and in, in that case, they won't be involved in it, and it's useless. So, I, I would then supplement that, that dimension. This dimension, if you like, is, is the one I've just been talking about. But you've also got this dimension of task involvement, task engagement, which is equally important or maybe even more important there. there. So, so, that you, 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 so that you may have um, an activity which is, which is uh, message-oriented, but it might be boring, so it's down in box C. Or you might have a, a, an activity which is message-oriented and engaging. So that would be in, in D. I guess that's the, the one that at some point we'd like to aim to organise. But likewise, with form-oriented ones, we might have form-oriented ones which, according to the, 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 the dogma of CLT, are supposed to be boring. But actually, very often, they might be really engaging. A lot of these repetition things or singing songs you, you could say that they're, they're just focusing on the forms, you, you know, but really very engaging. And that you can really sort of discuss, you know, which ones are the ones that really contribute most to language learning. 
It's certainly not necessarily the ones which are more communicative. And, and, and so that's, that's another dimension anyway. So that, that's what I've just said really. So that, 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 that would be, that's, that's, the, that's the framework which I personally mentally use. When, when, when I'm trying to think of what, what activities is it worthwhile trying to do and or what, how is it worthwhile trying to organise them. I suppose you would always want to aim for the highest task engagement because that's the basis on which learning takes place. Without that, no learning will take place. But with the other one, it then becomes a kind of, a, a kind of every teacher making his or her own decision. How do I make the balance between form-oriented activities, which are more analytical, more analytical, more experiential and message oriented in order to lead towards communicative competence and each teacher will make his or her own balance between the things in developing his or her own approach so some of the things then that within that approach need to be you know we, we need to we, we as teachers always need to think first of all what is this optimal balance between analytic and experiential strategies so along that horizontal axis is there one it won't be the same for every place but for every context we need to try to find some kind of balance between the the analytical and the experiential activities and work with it not necessarily one leading to the other but sort of how they might complement each other in different ways and also in different sequences Finding ways to structure classroom interaction more effectively, not only when the teacher is con in control, but I think one of the ways where we're really lacking is that we haven't really found very effective ways of structuring classroom interaction when the teachers are, are, are not in control. The learners are learning ind independently in task interaction because, you know, the common experience is that they just go off and use the mother tongue. Well, as somebody said, maybe you want them to use the mother tongue. But, but, but I mean, that, that's another question altogether. But, but, but most, most teachers who are teaching English would like them to be using English. But, but th there we are. But then, how do we find ways to deepen the content of, communi of the communication? There, a lot, of, a lot of the communication in, 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 in communicative language teaching has been really quite sort of trivial and superficial, you know, sort of organising little parties which will never take place and talking about little people who don't really exist, you know. Well, you know, to engage the learners on that up and down access, we, we, we really need to find more, 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 more engaging ways, maybe using literature, poetry, uh, and, and, and things like that. There are some interesting articles going around now about how, including one in the, la in the, in, in the latest Kate journal, no, one about two, two, uh, two ago, how you can use stories and things like that to deepen the content of language learning so that it really becomes something meaningful. And, 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 then, and then related to that maybe, exploring the role of the L1 because that's an, another one where we all have our different opinions and we all need to experiment. It's related maybe to deepening the content because it opens up all kinds of avenues for bringing in more interesting things into the classroom. But then also, of course, how can we explore, uh, exploit, a, a, a create a rich L2 environment in the classroom? But it's related also to the same thing. What sorts of things can we discuss, etc.? What kinds of interaction can we set up to deepen it? And then, go, now going, go, touching now, this is where I finish, cause, and, and it's a good, good place to finish, really, because it's now touching on, on the, I think I think I finished, I better check up, okay, just in case I've got over the two hours worth. No, I haven't. <laughs> no. I'm only joking, I know it really. <laughs> so, sorry, I, 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 I'm used to a class of um, chi Chinese students who laugh at every little stupid joke that you make, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I mustn't overdo it. Um, uh, but, 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 then, uh, but, but, but then, looking back to what Dick Allwright was talking about this morning, in general, trying to sort of flesh out these links between the theory and the practice but through, and research, not separating them, but having them all working together, for example, through collaborative research, explora exploratory research, action research, and exploratory practice, what are the different ways for renewing the whole communication-oriented um, repertoire and, 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 and approach using all, all of those. So that, that's, uh, that, that's, that's uh, exactly at quarter past according to my watch, but two minutes early according to the clock, which I cannot see, but somebody... Oh, no. 
is it was the other clock that was two minutes slow. This one might be two minutes fast. <laughs> That's all I've got to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.